Security work, I've done bits of product security work, so Firefox and Firefox for Android. Uh, I've done various bits of building tools and things. So if you use tools like the OWASP app, I've been helping Simon Bennett out with a bunch of the newer features on that. And um, being from Mozilla, I both have a reason to want to talk about this and some experience with the subject matter. So Mozilla came up with content security policy. It's a technology that was originally specified by Mozilla people. Um, I've worked on it a bit in Firefox, the developer tools warnings that you get in CSP was code I wrote. And I've got a reason to talk about it because my colleagues at Mozilla, my colleagues in the various browser vendors that work together on building standards for the web, they work very hard to build security features for the platform that we're providing people, and yet they are fairly rarely used. So I want to improve web security, and we have a situation, particularly with this technology, that it's really heavily underused. So let's have a look at some numbers. There was a um, blog recently, blog post recently from Veracode, which um, let's see if I can get this working. You know, you're doing a presentation, you're torn between mirroring your screens and having different views. If you're uh, wanting to have more than one tab, it's a good idea if you mirror the views in any way. So, this is from the, the Ver Vericode blog, and they did a header survey where they looked at the various security headers and how, how often they're used. And when it's finally loaded, we'll see some numbers on, on various security headers. And among those numbers are some figures on the use of CSP. And there we go. We can see that of the top million sites, as listed by Alexa, there are approximately 400 of them making use of content security policy in the survey data. So 300 out of the top million isn't many sites, and that's a sad thing. It's a sad thing if you build a platform that has a really useful security feature and people don't use it too much. So that's really why I wanted to do this talk. I wanted to talk about how there's a really useful thing out there and people are not making enough use of it. So I'm going to talk about CSP, that's the, that's the plan for the talk. And first of all, I'm going to start off by explaining some context because we need to understand some things before we can make use of the technology. So we're going to start off talking about cross-site scripting. And who here does web dev work? Put your hand in there if you do web development work. Who has to secure websites? Secure websites at all? Okay. Who does other development type stuff? And this is sad, we've got a, a room full of people that aren't programmers. Um, so we're going to talk about cross site scripting because that's valuable context. Then we're going to talk about the CSP and what it is and why it was created. And we're going to talk about why CSP is difficult as a technology for people to implement. And really the focus of the talk is about making it less awkward because CSP has been around for a couple of years now. People have stayed away from it in droves and there are tricks that people can use to make use of it that they might not be aware of. And then I want to talk about some common mistakes people make when implementing this technology. So first of all, hands in here if you know what cross-site scripting is. Okay, so we all know a bit about cross-site scripting. Do we know about different flavours of cross-site scripting? Shout out, you don't need to put your hand up. Reflected, okay. Stored. Stored, okay. The first two answers I expected. Anything else? Dom. Dom. Okay. So there we go. So sometimes we categorise cross-site scripting by reflected and stored. And in case somebody here doesn't know what, what those things are, let's have a look at an example of reflected cross-site scripting. So there we go. Okay. Here's one I made earlier. Let's say document which um, takes a parameter called test. We've managed to stick some stuff on the URL, when we request the page, the payload is reflected back to the client and executed in the browser in the context of the site that you were visiting. Okay. Now, um, DOM is a little bit different. Now, sometimes we categorise by whether a cross-site scripting attack is reflected or stored. 
But we can also categorize on where the attack happens. Uh, and this is why DOM cross-site scripting is interesting, because conventional cross-site scripting, your reflected and stored that we were talking about before, these are vulnerabilities that exist in server code, where input provided by the client is replayed in the response. DOM-based cross-site scripting takes place on the client, so there's JavaScript running in the document that's served by the server, and the vulnerability is in that JavaScript. And what makes that interesting is that you don't need dynamic content served from your server at all to be vulnerable to a DOM cross-site scripting attack. You could have static content on your website, for example, a brochureware that sits alongside the applications, which can potentially cause problems to the rest of your application by nature of the fact that they're vulnerable to DOM cross-site scripting. Uh, and to look at an example of that, uh, again, we load a document and immediately some script is executed, but this happens in a slightly different way. So rather than being um, reflected from the server, the issue is actually in the HTML that's served. If we look inside the head, we'll see there's a script element. If we look inside the script element, we'll see that when the document is loaded, something from the hash part of the URL is put into something unsafe in our HTML in this case, and bad things happen. It's actually pretty good advice to never use an HTML. Um, if you are using an HTML, you should know that there's probably something faster and there's certainly something safer. Okay, so that's um, all we need to know about cross-site scripting before we start. Now, cross-site scripting shares a interesting property with lots of other types of vulnerability. And David, in, in the last session, had a conversation where he was reeling off problems with different sites. And we can think about a common theme in application security. If we think about um, stack overflows, if we think about uh, SQL injection, if we think about heap overflows, if we think about cross-site scripting, command injection, use after free vulnerabilities, all of that sort of thing, what's the one thing that they all have in common? What do all of these problems have in common? What unites these vulnerabilities? User input. Can be user input, yeah. So user input is data, right? What happens to that data in all of these cases? The failure of validation routines? Um, yes, there is a failure of validation routines possibly, and that results in some data being interpreted as as what? Instruction. Instruction, okay. So all of these vulnerability classes, they, they stem from the fact that if we don't design systems properly, there can be confusion within a system on what is just data to be processed as data, and what is actually instructions to be processed as application logic. Okay, so in the case of a stack overflow, you end up overwriting an important pointer. In the case of command injection, then you can make your um, interpreter of commands do something it shouldn't do. And they all look pretty much the same. In terms of the mechanism of how that happens, there might be small differences, but fundamentally, these all have the same problem. Okay. And if we look at all of these things, we can see that um, over time, people have come up with ways of mitigating vulnerabilities of each of these types. So in the case of a stack overflow, people came up with ways of putting canary values on the stack. So you know something's been overwritten, and you can make sure that you clean up after yourself in a safe way. Or, or in the case of SQL injection, people came up with ways of making type safe and um, parameterized queries so that you couldn't put something in in such a way that um, is unsafe. And going back to another one of the talks earlier on, the reason why um, certain legacy PHP techniques for making database input safe were, were removed was because there were other safer ways of doing things. And again, developers stayed away from them in droves. And if you do pen testing work on PHP applications today, you'll still find SQL injection everywhere because Developers have got into the habit of doing the wrong thing. So content security policy tries to imitate some of these mitigation methods. And the way it does it is by saying, well, look, um, we need to make sure that we have separated uh, content, um, which is data, and content, which is instructions. And anything which we can't be sure of as being an instruction in some way, we have to not execute it. Okay. Uh, and the way it does that is by providing a policy with each document that is served to the client. Um, typically, it's via a response header. And that policy says, this document, um, for example, by default won't have any inline scripts or it won't have any inline styles. 
And therefore, when the browser sees something that looks like an inline script or an inline style, it says, no, nah, I know that I'm not supposed to be doing anything with inline script or inline styles, so I'm not going to treat them as instructions. I'm not going to execute that script. I'm not going to apply that style to the document. And so it's a policy, and it secures content. <laughs> That's all there is to it. And we can talk a little bit about what those things, what the policies look like in a moment. But the key thing here is we're talking about separation of data and instruction. We're talking about clear de delineation between what is supposed to be code and what is supposed to be uh, data to be handled in a different way. So let's look at an example. Here we have a sample content security policy. Hopefully it's not broken. Last time I did this talk, I got a mistake in it. So we've got the header name at the top, content security policy. And we can do various things. We can say things like default source self. So this is telling the document that by default, I don't want you to trust anything that's from a different origin to the origin that this document was served from. Okay, so if it's served from example.com over um, SSL, then we're only looking for secure documents served from example.com. Okay? Uh, and then we can refine for various classes. We can say object source none. I don't want you to load any plugins, please. Any plugins, just don't load them from anywhere. Disallow it completely. Uh, and by default in a content security policy, inline scripts and inline styles are forbidden. You can turn that off, you can turn anything off in a content security policy. But by default, inline scripts, and that includes script valued attributes, so your DOM level zero event handlers, uh, they don't work either. And you can also say, well, if anything goes wrong with this policy, if when I'm trying to apply this policy to this document, something breaks, uh, you know, that might be a sign of something going wrong. Maybe someone's found a, a cross-site scripting attack on our site and they're trying to exploit our users. Well, you can send reports to, to a provided URI to say, send the information on what's going wrong here. So, I did an example earlier on of a reflective cross-site scripting. And you can try the same thing with a sample policy applied. Okay, so there we go, we've got the same page that we saw before, exactly the same document, and the only difference to this, if you look in the Firefox network panel, the request looks exactly the same, the code is exactly the same, all that's different is that here we have a content security policy as generic as they get, just allow, just allow stuff from this origin and don't allow inline scripts and inline styles. And despite the fact that script was injected into the document, you can find me know where that happened here, or maybe here. There we go. Despite the fact that script is injected, CSP says, no, I'm not having that. And we get a handy little notification to say, the page is setting the blocks for loading of a resource. So we had a vulnerable document there that was as vulnerable to the simplest possible reflective cross-site scripting attack. And because there was a CSP applied to the document, on any browser that supports content security policy, and that's a growing number, that attack would not have succeeded. Right. So that's a good thing. We, we like that value security. So that's content security policy, and that's what it looks like at a high level. So you'll have to remember that. Just uh, after you said a growing number of browsers support that, which ones do you at the moment? Um, do you know? So WebKit supported it for a while. Um, so um, Safari supports it. Blink supports it, obviously. So Opera and Chrome support it. Um, Firefox has supported early versions for ages. So it's really only Internet Explorer that doesn't support it. And I saw recently that they're working on it now, which is great. So uh, hopefully that means that soon everyone will support at least a subset of this, which is good. Okay, and there are a bunch of different directives you can apply. So the source directives, you can specify where you want certain things to load from. So by default, at the top, or scripts, or styles, or objects. Connect is for things like XHR, for making uh, XML HTTP requests, or if you're using WebSockets or something like that. Connect source is useful to know about because that talks about where you can make connections to uh, and so on. So we've seen an example of a, of a CSP applied to a document. 
Um, we've got an understanding of how it works. That's great, right? Everyone should be using this because even if you've got these vulnerabilities, most of your users have browsers that mean that they are invulnerable to them, right? Surely that's a good thing. Well, actually, the numbers I showed at the beginning tell a bit of a sad story. If only 400 or so of the top million sites are making use of CSP, I think we'd all agree that's bad news because we'd like all of the sites we use to not be vulnerable to cross-site scripting in the browsers that we use. But it's not all that bad because there are already some major sites that, that make use of this. Um, Twitter, for example, they haven't yet applied a CSP to, to Twitter.com, the version of the site we use in the browser, but everything else they have applied it to. So if you're using the mobile version of this site, if you're reading the Twitter blog, if you're using TweetDeck, if you're using the Ads Center, if you're using the Translation Center, or Twitter for Business, or any one of those things, Twitter have got CSP everywhere. And that's good. And one of the good things about Twitter using it everywhere is that you can go to the Twitter blog and you can read about their stories and deploying it in these different sites. And they're quite open about what they've done and how they've done it and the challenges that they've found. And the challenges that they've found can be as useful to us as they can be to you because when we are sending people to the various standards bodies who are looking at this kind of thing, we can say, well, this is a problem in practice because people have this problem or people have that problem. And that can be a useful feedback cycle for us. So there are already some major sites using this. And there are some even more major ones who are shortly to follow. And they've mostly been waiting on some features in a newer version of the CSP standard that I'll talk about in a little bit. And another place where it's used is actually in web browsers themselves. So a lot of people don't realize this, but um, who, who saw the news uh, in the last week about this breach browser that's written in Node and embeds Chromium and you can build your own web browser from JavaScript. Did anyone see that? Yeah? Okay. Well, a lot of people said, wow, a web browser written in JavaScript. Um, actually, a lot of most modern browsers aren't just written in C and C++. Lots of front-end stuff tends to be written in other technologies. Firefox, for example, there's a smallish Gecko core. And everything, all the application logic that sits on top of that is written in JavaScript and is displayed using um, Zool and HTML. So it's kind of analogous to how a web application works. Um, with the important difference that if you've got cross-site scripting in there, you've got a big problem. So um, modern browsers are applying CSPs to the bits of the UI um, that uh, are implemented using those technologies. Bits of Chrome use it in that way, and bits of Firefox are being worked on in that way. And another interesting area are things like um, Chrome apps or Firefox OS apps. If you have an app written in Chrome, you have the option of applying a CSP to that. Um, the Firefox OS example is an interesting one because uh, here you have a, a phone where the entire operating system, um, including things like the keyboard and the home screen and stuff, uh, are implemented in HTML5. And with some of the APIs that phones allow you to use, like being able to make calls or send SMS or things like that, it could quickly get expensive if something went wrong with your phone in that way. Uh, CSP is applied by default to anything in Firefox OS that requests any kind of privileged access to the device. And as a result of this kind of thing, we start to get metrics that tell a very different story from the introduction I gave about CSP being underused. So yes, only about 400 out of the top million sites make use of a CSP, but 18% of all Chrome document loads, according to the Chromium project, have a CSP applied. Okay. Now, if low adoption makes you think twice about the technology, turn it round. Tell yourself that you're one of the bad 82% if you don't use CSP, and hopefully that'll um, make you think differently about it. So, perhaps at this point you're thinking, you know, that's awesome, but we've already got a website, okay? And some of the restrictions you've talked to us about already would make things really hard, okay? So, if you're not allowing inline scripts by default, that's kind of a headache because we've got inline scripts all over the place. We're using them for Google Analytics. Uh, it's the way our web devs did things for years. Okay, And sure, you've told us that if we apply a policy, we can, if we want, turn off things like the, the restrictions on inline scripts and inline styles. But then if we do that, our policy will be too relaxed to actually be useful. If we're allowing inline scripts and we've got a script injection problem, then we're back where we started, right? So CSP can be a series of very 
awkward balancing acts when we're, we're applying it to existing environments. And we really need to think about what we can do. And the reason this is important for me is that if we're building security features into browsers, if we're going into the trouble of going through um, the standards process to, to build things, then it's really important that the security features that we build can be applied to the web that we've got and not just the web that we want to build. Because the web that we want to build, sure, the internet might be doubling in terms of the number of sites that are active every two years or something like that. But that still means that in two years' time, half of the sites are vulnerable to all this legacy stuff, right? So what can we do? What, what's happened? Well, one of the things that's happened is that people who went away and decided that they wanted to use CSP, some of them found problems with libraries and things that they used, and they said, oh, well, it's a nice idea, but we can't use it yet. And some of those people went along to the people whose stuff didn't work in that environment. They went along to the authors of things like um, jQuery or other front-end frameworks, or, or even server-side frameworks, saying, you're doing this stuff here, and it makes it impossible or really difficult to apply this technology that we quite like. Can you fix it, please? And nicely, some of the people that maintain those things have gone away and they've fixed those problems. So if you're using a modern version of a widely used JavaScript library, for example, you'll probably find that changes have been made relatively recently to allow for things like um, usage in scenarios where eval is, is disallowed, or usage for scenarios where inline script is awkward, and so on and so forth. So that's a great thing. And then on the server side, um, frameworks have started gaining support. There are open tickets on the Django project for implementing CSP as part of the Django core. Django is an uh, excellent web framework if you use Python, which is much better than Ruby, incidentally. <laughs> and um, there's already support via third-party modules for Django. James Sopo wrote a library called Django CSP, which um, I've been doing a bit of work on recently as well. But most importantly, uh, CSP has gained a bunch of new features. We, we've realized the fact that if we're building for the web we've got, then something that's too restrictive means that people can't use it. Um, so CSP 1.1 or 2, as it's actually now known, uh, has support to include things like inline scripts, but to do it in a safe way. You're probably thinking, well, how's that going to work? How's that going to work? We'll see, we'll see in a bit how that's going to work. And now there are better tools available as well. So some of the things that were really awkward to start off with, like um, in either of the browsers where you're making use of CSP because Chrome and Firefox supported it, and you had a, a CSP violation, the warning messages were frankly awful and told you very little about what had gone wrong in trying to apply this policy to this document. So the browsers have better support for telling you what went wrong and why, and various third-party tools have been built which allow you to do things like analyse your site and find out what would be a good policy to apply to that site. So that's changed as well. So let's have a look at the new features in CSP2 and have a think about how they work. So the first one is um, a feature called nonce source. Now, nonce is a number used once, we know what that is, and source, these would be the scripts that we load when we are loading a document in our browser, okay? Um, nonce source is really quite simple. It's a way of saying, okay, well what we need to do is we need to distinguish in the document that's loading between the stuff that's supposed to be there and the stuff which really shouldn't be. Okay? So we're serving a document, it's got scripts in it already, and we need those to run because we need them to be there. But if a script is injected, we don't want that to execute. And the way that nonce source does this is it says we're going to create a nonce and we're going to store that in the policy somehow. And what we're going to do is we're going to, to, to tag with little attributes on the script elements in the document which ones we intend to see. Okay? So you create the script element, you give it this nonce in the um, HTML that you would send back, and because the nonce in the header matches the nonce on the script attribute, you know that this script is supposed to be run. So let's use the same um, example that we had before. I had to change it to include some inline scripts that were supposed to run, so let's do that. And to prove that JavaScript is still working, uh, First of all, let's have a look at the policy that's applied on the loader. 
So we've got a, we've got a policy here, and we can see that there's a, a nonce value in the, the policy. Uh, and to prove that the scripts that are in line are still executing, we can have a look at the page. We can see that there is some script which is supposed to be run. Um, there we go. So this is the script that's supposed to be run. There we go. So on document load, we're adding a click listener on this button. We click that, and you can see that it works. Okay. So the script that's meant to be there is still working, but we're still doing our injection. And if we look further down in the document, we can see that the injected script element is still there. Um, and yet it isn't executed. And the only difference between this script element here and the one further up is that the one further up has this nonce attribute set on it. <coughs> and this can be really useful because if you've got legacy stuff, all you have to do to change your application to make use of this is to set that response header, find all the places where you're doing scripts, audit them carefully to make sure that they don't have anything in them that's dy dynamically generated by the server, for obvious <coughs> reasons, and then add that attribute to the script tag. Okay. So you can take something, it might be years old, it might be full of cross-site scripting holes, but because it's a, an internal system that you need to keep using, you need to keep it running, you can apply this to it, and as long as the browser you use internally supports this feature, you've got a way of mitigating that particular problem. Which is great, right? That's a good thing. But I started out when we talked about cross-site scripting, describing the fact that because there are um, scripts which can run, that because there are cross-site scripting vectors and things that can run on the server, and things that can run on the client, you know, your DOM-based stuff that runs in JavaScript, it doesn't fix the problem completely for us. Because we might have you know, 10, 15 years of static content on our website that we don't really want to have to go through and change. Maybe we used to use an old content management system that we don't have a license for anymore, and we've got all these generated files, but we don't want to have to go through them all and, and remove all the inline scripts. And because they're static, we can't do this trick where we're injecting this header and this script attribute. So what can we do there? And that takes us on to the, the next thing. That takes us on to another CSP2 feature which is called hash source. So hash source um, has something to do with hashes and something to do with script source again, right? And in this case, what happens is when we're serving the document, what we do is we say, okay, we know that the whole of this document is not something that we can change. It's something that we serve statically from disk, okay? It's just an HTML file. We can't inject these script attributes, these nonce attributes. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to take all of the inline scripts in the document and we're going to generate a hash of them, okay? So we're going to generate an SHA512 hash or something. And we're going to serve a CSP directive that has in it a list of all of the hashes for the scripts that we want to run, okay? And Again, we can show this in action. So I'm going to take the same uh, DOM XSS that we had before. I'm going to do exactly the same thing. We've got the same hash part of the URL. It's the same document. And the only difference is, as you've guessed, that we've applied a CSP. And this time, we can see a hash that's sent with that policy that says there's a script here that I do want you to run and anything else I don't want it to happen. Okay? So again we've got the vulnerable code unchanged. We've still got this script in the head of the document which pulls something from the URL hash and does bad things with it. It's still there, it's completely unmodified. But again, CSP is saying uh, Something tried to happen here that I'm not happy with. Don't do this, please. So the content security policy has, again, blocked. But we can allow other things that take place in the document to work by um, 
using these hash values. Now, actually, this wasn't the example I wanted to use. Maybe I'll go back to that video. Let's not worry about that for now. Okay. So those are two new CSP features, and that's kind of nice. Now, I mentioned earlier on that when you're using these features, you've got to be really, really careful, because if, for example, you wrote something which took your existing content and just applied policies to them using script hash, uh, using hash source or, or non-source, then you'd have the problem that you're just giving potentially vulnerable code a free pass to run in the browser, right? So you've got to be really careful about how you do that kind of thing. Now, I talked a little bit earlier on about um, a Django middle there called Django CSP, which allows you to do a bunch of CSP things easily in that web framework. Um, a thing that I did for Django CSP was to say, wouldn't it be great if we have a way of not only automatically inserting the script elements with the attributes set in the document, but also preventing developers from shooting themselves in the foot when they use it. Okay. So here we have a, a custom tag in Django which says, um, here is a script, and anything that happens within this script um, can run, because we've, we've set this attribute automatically with this magic tag. But by default, if you find anything within that that is generated, if you find any other Django tags or any other Django variables, just stop it from rendering. Okay? So you can create something which contains a script that's got an automatically applied um, nonce attribute on the script element. And if you try and inject anything in there, if the, if the template designer does something stupid, it says, nah, you can't do that. Um, but developers want foot goes, right? Because sometimes they do actually need to do the dangerous thing. But it's important for us as security people to be able to review those. So what we can do here is, if you absolutely need to shoot yourself in the foot, potentially, then you can say, okay, I want a script and I want it to be dangerous. And then you can use your static analyzers or whatever to run over your templates and say, oh, here's something we need to review because uh, someone down in development needed to shoot himself in the foot. So there we go. Uh, that is the sort of thing that you can do with these features, which is useful. Okay. Um, but even if you use things like this, we still have some problems. For example, I mentioned at the beginning, if you're not allowing inline scripts, you have a problem with your script valued attributes. So if you've got a link and you've got an on-click handler, your DOM level zero stuff, that says, run this function and if the return value is false, don't follow the link. People use this quite a lot, it's been part of the web for a while. This isn't going to work unless you allow unsafe in line. And if you allow unsafe in line, you basically need to apply the CSP in the first place. But there are ways that you can use to fix this kind of thing. And one of the little toys I'm playing around with at the moment is a tool which takes an existing document and will extract all of the um, event handlers that use this method of doing things and turn them into a script that you can include in the head of your document and apply them the, the new proper way so that you don't have inline scripts in your document, which can be a useful thing. So there we go. Um, and I talked a bit about better tools. I talked about how there are things available that can allow you to, to take your site as it is, um, feed it through a tool, and get out of the tool what is the most strict possible policy you can apply to that document or those documents. And there's a tool by a chap I know called Kailash Patel, which you can install in a browser, browser add-on. You can browse the site that you're looking after and get out of it what the strictest policy that could be applied to that site is. And there can be some wins even on that. I mean, even if you're allowing things like inline scripts, being able to turn off anybody being able to inject objects can be useful for various reasons. And there is benefit to applying it even if you're making the policy fairly weak. Um, there are also hash generation tools. So the static examples I showed you there, um, I generated those using a, a fairly simple script which literally just takes the documents you've got. Let's show that working. I don't know if it's too scary to come on. Well, there we go. So we're going to say all the stuff within that directory there, the sorcery directory, 
I want you to, to generate uh, hash source attributes for that. So we run that, and then we can cat this file and see the policy that we just generated. So you can take loads of HTML source files or even PHP if they're in line within that, and just generate the hashes, which can be a useful time-saving thing. Again, don't do this without some serious review of what's going to happen when you do that, but it can save you time when you're doing it. There are other tools that people are building. Um, people are building reports, dashboards. A colleague of mine at Mozilla is building one that's really cool. Um, another one is being worked on by some people at Yandex, the Russian search engine. And there are many other tools out there for making it easier to do various things with CSP. So, you've got a few ideas here, how you can apply CSP to stuff that you've already got, and you're thinking, great, I'm gonna go and do that. But before you do, I've got some words of warning. <coughs> Okay, the first one comes from uh, the chap I mentioned who did the user CSP tool that infers a policy from a site. He also did a header survey, which is kind of like the header surveys that other people do, but his was really specifically about CSP. The chap's name is Kalash Patel, if you want to follow him up. Um, and he had a look at what people were actually putting in their policies. And to his dismay, he found that very often, people are applying policies that are completely useless. So let me show you an example. Obviously, you'd think, if people were going to the trouble of enabling the header and working out what the policy needs to look like, they'd think about what the policy um, that they're, they're applying and they'd think about what it does. And it turns out that they're not doing that at all. So this is for some organisation, which I'm not going to call out. I'm sure you can read it if your eyesight's good enough. But they've got a CSP which basically turns CSP off. Okay? So we're going to apply a policy that doesn't apply any policy. Good work, A star. Okay. Um, so that's an example of a thing that you can do. So if you're applying a CSP, try and make sure that the policy that you're applying makes sense. Don't just apply the policy that turns itself off, because that's dumb. Don't do that. Um, another thing that people do is people forget about the same origin policy, right? They say, okay, well, we've got this application and it's running on Django or whatever that supports CSP really nicely. We're going to turn CSP on and we're quite safe, okay? But even those things that provide these nice CSP features might apply the policy um, inconsistently. So here we have the documentation for Django CSP. If you've shipped a configuration of Django which uses this and you've left the defaults on, and you've got the admin app turned on and available to the internet, which people do sometimes. Don't do that, but people do. You'll notice that admin is not covered by the CSP configuration. So if there's a vulnerability within the admin part of the application and the user that's being targeted by the attack um, can see that page, uh, or if it's on a page before login, if it's just reflected, um, but if it's just for anyone, then you've potentially got a problem there. So if you're going to make use of CSP, make sure that you're applying it consistently. And in particular, with regards to applying it consistently, think really carefully about static content, because people, again, will go to the trouble of, of applying all the CSP bells and whistles to the dynamic parts of their site, and forget about the fact that maybe they've got something somewhere else which uses some old JavaScript library or, or some old and flash document that introduces them to a, a DOM type vulnerability. So remember the stuff that can be vulnerable on the client as well as the server and apply the policy to everything that you can and the things that you can't apply, move them onto a separate subdomain. Um, ideally in such a way that you don't have related domain type attacks. So those are some common mistakes that can be made. Now that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, I've left a little bit of time for questions, seeing as no one's heckled. So if you've got any questions. No, yes, I have got some left last two behind. No one wants any of the books. Does anyone want oh, books? Yeah. We've got you know, four books. Yeah. Well, I've got two, two, two copies of object oriented JavaScript. <laughs> this book is an oxymoron, it's wicked cool PHP. If you want to write vulnerabilities, this book's going to be better. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> people write good stuff in PHP. I just haven't seen it. Um, wicked cool Perl scripts. Oh goodness me. <laughs> Books don't fly as well as you'd think. Okay. So there was a question over here. What was your question? So what Steve will give a reason for creating a policy where there is no policy for the license or that way of that policy? Um, there's a legitimate reason. So the question was, is there a legitimate reason for applying a policy that doesn't apply a policy? Um, there are legitimate reasons for applying a policy that almost might not apply a policy, and that is that you can be fairly specific about what you're allowing and what you're denying. So if you're being tricky about things, you might be able to set a specific path to cover a resource that you know is vulnerable whilst not touching the rest of the thing. Okay? In terms of applying a policy that doesn't actually do anything, the only thing I can think of that would make you do that is if you want to be able to say you've used CSD and your CV. Um, so, yeah, I, I can't think of a reason why people would do that. Why, why create the ability to be able to do that as a future CSD? You'd have to decide which feature you didn't want people to be able to turn off. If you haven't everything except, you need to decide what that thing is if you're going to completely prevent it. And it may be that in future versions of the various browser developer tools, people will do things like say, okay, you're applying a CSP, but actually it's useless, don't be so stupid, fix it, or things like that. And there are people working on various projects for providing Firefox items that do that sort of thing with Firefox developer tools. Um, I don't know about the other browsers, but I'm sure the Chrome Dev Tools team will be looking at it as well. If you have a, a static launch file, what's to stop whoever it is that's targeting the injection? Just strictly speaking, if it's a static launch file, it's not a nonce, because you've used it more than once. So, so what you do is you have a separate nonce value for every response that you send. Um, so that the attacker can't know the value when they're trying to inject. The, the idea is that if the attacker can see what the nonce is, you've got a worse problem anyway, right? Yeah. So make sure that your nonce value is firstly sufficiently random, uh, and secondly, changes with every request. Pick a random number three, but well, use that for everyone, okay? <laughs> Don't do that. Yep? There's a question about browser support. You mentioned that IE is not supported. IE doesn't support it yet. Um, I saw on the IE features matrix thing of stuff that's in the W3C specs that they actively have people developing it at the moment. Well, coupled with that as well, obviously it's uh, an extra header. Is the Knox networking equipment which strips that header as long as standard? Um, if you've got networking equipment that strips headers that it doesn't know about, you probably want to send it back. Um, no, but obviously the network hardware gets installed and left for a long time. Right, okay. Well, it's, it's a W3C standard, 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 so... Headers which are like through quite often. Yeah, I, I, I feel like with various recent security features, if you've got network stuff that strips headers that don't understand, you've probably got other problems. So loads of stuff like um, X-Frame options or HSTS. There are lots of, you know, core stuff as well. If, if you've got networking equipment that will strip stuff out of um, request or response headers, you likely have various issues anyway that you might not realise. From a sort of business point of view, I love the sites have horrible tracking bugs and advertising. Loads of these sites are all heavily developed using JavaScript directly on your site. Is that capable of <coughs> using these things? And how difficult would it be to craft something? Because you don't think it's up to your business if your business wants ads, tracking, affiliates, all the rest of that stuff. Yeah, so you can, um, theoretically, your um, maximum header response size is only determined by the software that you're using. Not all of it, of course, is under your control because users have their browser of choice, but right? um, you could have very large and will be response headers, but um, Generally, I think, people are starting to come around to the fact that using these features by including JavaScript and third-party domains isn't best security practice anyway. Um, and you can, you can do various things to make one of these policies a little bit easier than they might have been. And um, you don't have to be hugely specific for everything. Um, and in many cases, just disallowing your inline scripts is going to fix your problem for you anyway. 
even if you've got um, script sources that include all of the various affiliates that you've got. Um, so there's facility in that you can, in theory, turn everything on you want to. In practice, that might be difficult from a maintenance perspective. In practice, you might be sending in fees for you large headers and things like that. What's the overall cost of Firefox for uh, multiple headers, which are the same? So think along the lines of that if you've got a vulnerability where you could inject the header into the response, and I inject the content security policy, yeah. which one's going to say preference to downgrade the policy? So the specification says that when you have multiple CSP response headers, there should be an interception of those. And in terms of exact behaviour, uh, there have been votes in various proposals. So um, there was an issue I saw tweeted about the other week with Firefox related to that. Um, there are other interesting features of CSP as well that don't relate to how it is applied to a document it's intended for as well. Obviously you had the, uh, the random ones that's been generated for script tags. Uh, we also showed a Python tool to generate a uh, hash base. Obviously that hash is then going to be the same each time the page loads. Yeah, so for hash source to work, yeah. each time the page is served, it has to have the, the same script in so, the same form. Yeah, so, so what would happen if someone put a um, script in with that same tag? <coughs> you, um, is it going to actually hash it itself and check? Or? So someone would have to find a hash collision in the hash algorithm that you used. So it will check the, the tag, it will check the tag. Yeah. It's that hash. Yeah. So any, any source that's, that exists in the page, what happens is first it checks against various other um, types of source attribute, various domains or um, keywords, and then it says, well, okay, I'm going to take this thing, it doesn't match any of the others, so now we'll do the expensive step, we'll take this content, we'll, we'll hash it, and we'll compare that value against the allowed hashes in the, in the policy. One thing I didn't mention, which is um, potentially useful, um, the newer CSP standard has support for the inclusion of a policy via a meta tag. Um, so if you have a web host that doesn't allow you to set your own headers, um, you can maybe make use of that. Uh, as yet, it's only supported in Chrome, because there's a lot of arguing on the standards about whether or not it should be allowed for obvious reasons. But that's a thing that's coming soon. Okay. Any other questions?